اللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمدللہ رب العالمین والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین سیدنا و نبینا و شفینا ابی القاسم محمد الحمدللہ اللذی جعلنا من المتمسکین بی ولایت سید و مولای علی ابن ابی طالب علیہ السلام الحمدللہ اللذی هدانا لہذا و ما کننا لنحتدی لولا ان هدانا اللہ اما بعد یقول اللہ فی کتاب الكریم والفرقان الحمید وقوله الحق بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم وعاشروهن بالمعروف فإن كرهتموهن فعسى أن تكرهوا شيئا ويجعل الله خيرا كثيرا صدق الله العلي العظيم Domestic violence, also called intimate partner violence, occurs between people in an intimate relationship. Domestic violence can take many forms including emotional and physical abuse or threats of abuse. Many times people think that Domestic violence only includes physical violence such as beating or kicking one spouse. But the reality is emotional abuse, blackmail is also part of domestic violence. So you might be experiencing domestic violence if you're in a relationship with someone who tries to control all aspects of your life. Every time you want to go somewhere, that person stops you, tries to control every single thing that you do. This person, for example, may be possessive or too obsessive. These kinds of tendencies tend to occur. And of course, physical violence, such as kicking or beating. Within our discourse, we will focus more on the physical side of domestic violence and understand Islam's perspective towards it. And we will do so by responding to the following queries. Number one, what does the Quran say regarding treating one's spouse with compassion? and honor and dignity number two how did the holy prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam address domestic violence number three did domestic violence increase globally during the pandemic if so how sick is this society number four doesn't the quran this is interesting in surah 4 verse 34 the quran surah nisa verse 34 doesn't allah sanction and endorse wife beating Number five, what was the behavior of Imam Hussein towards his wives? Inshallah, we will try and answer these queries. I'll quote an excerpt. This will act as our claim for the majlis. This quote is from the book Domestic Violence, Islamic Perspective by M. Bashir Ahmad, MD. He says, and I quote, Under no circumstances is violence against women encouraged or allowed in Islam. There are many examples in Quran and Ahadith that describes the behavior of Muslims towards husband and wife. The relationship should be one of mutual love, respect and kindness. So let us try and understand the Quran and what does it say concerning treating one spouse or treating women in general with kindness. Open the Quran, Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 19. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعَاشِرُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ فَإِن كَرِهْتُمُوهُنَّ فَعَسَىٰ أَن تَقْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَيَجْعَلَ اللَّهُ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا And treat women. Live with women with kindness and compassion. Even if you dislike them. Why does Allah use the word dislike? Why? You see at that time there was a patriarchal system. So the Prophet aimed at smashing the patriarchy. And chauvinism, misogyny was prevalent. These men would think, we are superior towards women. We are better than women. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, personally, you may think that you are better than women. You may dislike their growth because you know, there are some people even today, when you tell them about women empowerment, when you tell them about the growth and development of women, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, even if you may not like their growth, even if you dislike them, but there is good in it. It is good for the country. It is good for the world when women evolve. Therefore, treat them with kindness. Abhijit Naskar in his book, The Bengal Tigress, a treatise on gender equality states, women are no sheep. Women are no fragile showpiece to be placed above the fireplace. Women are of the thinking society. 
and are builders of nations, women of the sentient society are the builders of the world. So Abhijit Naskar here highlights the importance of allowing women to evolve and progress. Imam Sadiq says in the book Principles of Marriage and Family Ethics, authored by Ayatollah Ibrahim Amin, Imam Sadiq says, whoever is our friend, whoever claims to be our follower, what do we call ourselves? The Shi'i of Imam. Whoever is our friend expresses his kindness to his spouse more. If you're a true friend of Imam, that means you exhibit and illustrate utmost love and compassion towards your spouse. The Prophet of Allah also stated in the book Mawa'iz Al-Adadiyya, page 151, none would respect women except the magnanimous ones. And none would disrespect them or hurt them except the ignoble ones. If you want to reduce the happiness within your life, then start mistreating your family and you'll see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala withdraws his blessings from you. Imam Sadiq says in Biharul Anwar, volume 103, page 236, one of the characteristics of all the prophets of Allah, Imam doesn't mention their valor, their knowledge, their dignity. Yes, all the prophets had hikmah, ilm, bravery. But the Imam here says one of the greatest characteristics of all the prophets of Allah was that they were kind to their wives. They were kind to their spouse. Unfortunately, this is not the trend we see in Muslim communities. 1993, there was a survey conducted by North American Council for Muslim Women. And the statistics are a bit baffling. The statistics showed that 10% of people or 10% of women complained that they were facing domestic violence. When 7% of American women claimed that they were facing domestic violence. Now, with all honesty, domestic violence is a problem in all communities. But we see that in the Muslim community as well, we aren't doing that well. We aren't really doing well when it comes to treating our families with love and respect. But the Prophet was completely the opposite. There's a hadith within Ibn Majah and Abu Dawood that almost 70 women approached the Holy Prophet and they said, our husbands are mistreating us. They're beating us. And at that time, these men were used to this patriarchal system that a man can do anything he wants. The Holy Prophet called them, reprimanded them, reproached them and said, you are all under the banner of Islam. If you mistreat your spouse, you are no longer under the banner of Islam. This is the Prophet. But the Holy Prophet says, if you mistreat your spouse, then you have left the banner of Islam. A 2011 report claims that 80% of women in Pakistan suffer from domestic violence. A 2004 study claimed that almost 50% of women in Pakistan claimed that they were physically battered, either kicked or slapped. What kind of a person are you if you hit your wife? You, some, some men say that, you know, we had a tough day at work. So you had a tough day at work, you take it out on your spouse. As Muslims, we need to think, do we just have the name of a Muslim or are we truly practicing the religion? The Holy Prophet had a difficult marital life. Someone may say, yeah, but my marital life is very difficult. So what? You have no right to raise your hand. You cannot resort to physical violence. According to the Quran, according to the messenger of Allah, according to the Ahlul Bayt, according to the law of your country. The Holy Prophet had a difficult marital life. Allah highlights this in Surah Al-Tahreem, chapter 66, verse 1 to 5. Ya ayyuhan nabi, lima tuharrimu ma ahallallahu lak. Allah says, why do you forbid yourself from that which Allah has allowed? And then Allah says that when the Prophet divulged, shared one of his secrets with one of the wives, the wife went and divulged the secret. She went and shared the secret. When I tell you a secret right now, what do you do? Do you go and spread the secret? No. You say that you, my husband, you shared it with me. I'll keep it to myself. But Allah says, Allah tells the Prophet, divorce your wives. Allah will replace them with better wives. But did the Prophet ever, once in his life, ever raise his hand? Never. Never. He would treat his wives with compassion and love. This is an interesting question. What about Surah 4 verse 34 of the Quran? Surah 4 verse 34, arguably one of the most controversial and polarizing verses. What does the verse say? As for those women whose ill talk you have reason to fear, admonish them first. Then distance yourself in bed and then finally hit them, strike them, beat them. I have with me here a renowned videographer, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Thomas, the Quran, you may think as a non-Muslim, you may think 
Did the Quran says beat your wives? How do you explain this? The explanation given by Ayatullah Kamal Haidari and Lale Bakhtiyar is very interesting. They give you the correct understanding of this ayah. So the word used here is Idhuribu Hunna, beat your wives. If you fear of nushus, if you have the fear of nushus, fine. It's a big problem. The Quran says beat your wives. Now someone may say, oh, but there's a limitation of how much. Look, look. Someone may say that I can hit my wife with a toothbrush. No, no, no. You can use a toothbrush and you can actually hurt your wife. You can use a handkerchief and cause damage. So how do you explain this verse? Ayatullah Kamal Haidari gives a phenomenal response. He says, first of all, if you consult Arabic dictionaries, this word daraba has multiple meanings. Number one. Number two, try understanding the language of the Quran by means of the Quran. Use the Quran the Quranic language to understand the Quran. If you open the Quran, Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 101, Allah says, وَإِذَا ضَرَبْتُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ When you go forth, journeying, traveling through the lands, as Allah says, beat the earth. وَإِذَا ضَرَبْتُمْ Same word. Does it make sense if I say beat the earth? What does this verse actually mean? Surah 4, verse 34. إِذْرِبُهُنَّ Beat your wives. Really? Because here in the Quran, we see Daraba used for a different context. Surah 3 verse 156, وَإِذَا ضَرَبُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ Travel throughout the land. Again Daraba, in a different context. Surah 73 verse 20, وَآخَرُونَ يَضْرِبُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ And others traveling throughout the land. Does it mean you beat the earth? No. When you travel, what happens? What do you do? You distance yourself from the house, right? You leave the house and you distance yourself. Nowadays, when people don't want to work, what do they do? They go on a strike. In India, sometimes when you go, you always hear hartal, strike. The taxes are on a strike. Recently, we saw the farmers protest in India, where many of them decided to go on a strike. What does the word strike mean in Arabic? Idurab means disassociating this but not attaching yourself to the workplace so what does the verse 434 actually mean it means yes advise them if the advice doesn't work then distance yourself from the house not beat them distance yourself give the wife time give yourself time but it does it has nothing to do with beating there's no relevance whatsoever Question, what if you're suffering from domestic violence? What do you do? Number one, talk to someone you trust. It can be a relative. It can be a close friend, an acquaintance. Someone you trust, number one. Number two, talk to a healthcare provider, a doctor, a medical expert. Ask them, I'm suffering. Please examine me. Give me advice. Number two. Number three. A local women's shelter or crisis center. You have NGOs, organizations working against fighting and combating domestic violence. Approach them, ask them, what do I need to do? I'm in a toxic relationship. I need to get out of it. Number four, a counseling or mental health center. Go to a psychiatrist, a psychologist, share. Number four, number five, a local court. You need to approach the police if there's a crime happening. Sometimes many crimes are hidden under the rug, but no, if it's a crime, it has to be exposed. The law of the land matters. So this is how you may attempt to solve the domestic violence problem if you personally have this problem. There's a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari where Rasulullah says, how does anyone beat his wife and sleep at night? How? How does your conscience allow you? Um al-Fadl, the daughter of Ma'moon was married to Imam al-Jawad. Constantly she would complain about Imam al-Jawad. Until an al-Mas'udi, a famous historian narrates that Umm al-Fadl is the one who poisoned the blessed Imam. Did the Imam ever raise his hand? Did he ever say, you constantly complain about me? You're not giving me happiness, therefore I raise. No, never, never. She poisoned the Imam, yet the Imam did not resort to violence. Imam Hussein was also known for his kindness and sweetness towards his wives. Imam Ali sent a proposal for the marriage of Imru Al-Qais bin Adi's daughter Rabab. 
Imru al Qais was a famous man in Arabia, the chief of the clan of Bakr bin Wa'il. So Imam Ali sent Imam Hussein's proposal and he willingly accepted. Imam married Rabab. Sheikh Abbas Qummi narrates that Imam Hussein says to Rabab, By your life, I cherish the house in which there are Sakina and Rabab. I endear them both and spend most of my wealth upon them. And there is no need for censor in that. You know, sometimes when the husband loves the wife too much, you're like, No, Imam Hussein said, there's nothing wrong in it. I love my wife. And I shall not let them be neglected all throughout my life until I am buried beneath the earth. Allahu Akbar. And look at what Rabab says. After Imam Hussein's martyrdom, Rabab, the wife of Hussein, she says, the illuminated one who was a source of light lies unburied in Karbala. O son of the Prophet, may Allah reward you favorably with regards to ourselves. You treated us with mercy and kindness. Now who remains for the orphans and destitutes? Who makes every deprived affluence and gives refuge to them? By Allah, I shall not establish relation with anyone else other than you until I am hidden beneath the earth. Rabab eulogizing upon the death of Aba Abdullah. You know who else loved Imam al Hussein equally? Layla. Imam Hussein treated his wives with so much respect that they were willing to sacrifice their sons for Hussein. Layla looks towards the heavens. Ya Allah, I pray that you give my son strength to give his life for Hussein. Allahu Akbar. According to narrations and the maqtals, Ali Akbar was the first to be killed from the Banu Abu Talib. The eminent Sheikh Ali bin Isa Irbili, he narrates this hadith in Kashful Ghamma, that once the Holy Prophet, he saw a group of youths, Qurayshi youth, and they were all so bright and illuminating. So the Holy Prophet looked towards them and he had a smile on his face. Suddenly the Prophet started crying. So they said, Ya Rasulullah, why are you crying? Aren't you happy seeing this young man? These young men? The Holy Prophet said, I just recalled as to how my family will have to face slaughter and expulsion at the hands of my Ummah. Ali Akbar's father, grandfather, from the mother's side, was a man by the name of Urwa bin Mas'ud al thaqafi According to Rasulullah, Urwa bin Mas'ud, was one of the four blessed men, one of the four noble men, alongside Bushr bin Bilal Abdi, Adi bin Hatim, and Suraqa bin Malik Madalji. In the ninth year after Hijra, Urwa bin Mas'ud converted to the religion of Islam. So he said, Ya Rasulullah, can I go and invite my tribe towards Islam? Maybe they might accept. I'll tell them about the beauty of this religion. So, Urwa bin Mas'ud al Thaqafi approaches his tribe. And he tells them that it's up to you whether you want to join or not. Islam is a religion of free will, whether you'd like to join or not. On one occasion, Urwa bin Mas'ud al Thaqafi was giving the Adhan, the Muslim call to prayer. And a man from his tribe saw him and he shot an arrow. Whilst reciting the Adhan, Urwa bin Mas'ud al Thaqafi lost his life. Look at the irony. Ali Akbar's grandfather was killed while reciting the Adhan. Whilst Ali Akbar, he was the one to deliver the Adhan on the day of Ashura. Look at the irony. Look at the beautiful irony. Both of them attained martyrdom whilst manifesting and embodying the prayer and the call. When the Prophet of Allah received the news of Urwa's martyrdom, he said, The similitude of Urwa is that of the believer of Yasin, who invited his people towards the religion of truth, but they killed him. Muhammad ibn Shahri Ashhub and Muhammad ibn Abu Talib opine that Ali Akbar was 18 years of age, while Sheikh Mufid states that Ali Akbar was 19 years old. Hussein bin Ali and many women in their tents, they started crying when Ali Akbar recited the Adhan, suspecting that this was the final Adhan of Ali Akbar. Abu Faraj al-Isfahani in Maqtal, Maqtal al-Talibiyyin, page 86, states that Ali Akbar was actually known as a muhaddith. He narrated several hadiths from Imam Ali. Ali Akbar stood in front of his father after Dhuhr prayers and said, Oh father, I seek your permission to go towards the battlefield and fight. Imam Hussein said, May Allah be with you. 
But Akbar, you know how much your mother, sisters and aunts value you and love you. Seek their permission first. Before you approach the battlefield, Ali Akbar entered the tent of his mother Layla. And as he was about to leave, all these women start holding the clock of Ali Akbar. Sheikh Fadlallah Hayri, in his book, he writes that whilst he was about to leave the tent, they held him and they said, Oh Akbar, how will we live without you? We will not be able to survive without you. Ali Akbar sought his father's permission, then came out riding a horse belonging to Al Hussein named Lahiq. A man shouted, Oh Ali, you have kinship with the commander of the faithful Yazid and we wish to safeguard it. So if you wish security, we will grant you security and amnesty. Ali Akbar replies, this is recorded in Siral Silsila, page 57. Ali Akbar says, the kinship I have with the messenger of Allah, peace of Allah and his blessings be upon him and his progeny is more worthy of being safeguarded. Then Sheikh Al-Mufid in his book Al-Irshad, he narrates, Ali Akbar recited these lines of poetry. Ali Akbar says, I am Ali, son of Hussein, son of Ali. We by the house's Lord are more worthy of the Nabi. By Allah, we shall never be ruled by the Da'i. With the sword shall I defend my family and strike like a young Hashimi Qarashi. Imam Hussein uncovered his hair and raised his hands to the heavens supplicating, O oh Allah, this is recorded by Ibn Tawus in Luhuf. He says, Imam Hussein, O oh Allah, bear witness against these folks that a man who looks like your Prophet Muhammad in his physique, mannerisms and eloquence has come out to fight them. Ali Akbar advanced toward them, reminiscent of his grandfather Ali. He fought bravely. Nonetheless, Murra ibn Munqidh al-Abdi stabbed him with his spear in the back and hit him with his sword on the head, splitting it in half. Abdul Razak al Muqarram narrates that Ali Akbar said, Assalamu alaika ya Aba Abdullah. Oh, my father, peace and salutations be upon you. Tabari narrates that Imam Hussein, whilst heading towards the battlefield, he said, There is no good in life after you. How dare they defy the most merciful and violate the sanctity of his messenger? Hussein walked towards the battlefield. When he saw Ali Akbar, Ali Akbar started hugging the Imam with his left hand. So the Imam was astounded. He said, Oh Ali Akbar, why are you hugging me with your left hand? Why are you hiding your chest with your right hand? Imam said, remove your hand. Ali Akbar said, no, do not worry my father, don't worry. Imam Hussein then said, no, please remove. And then the Imam removed the hand and he saw that a dagger was on the chest of Ali Akbar. And he saw his son in pain and in agony. In order to remove the pain and agony, what did Imam Hussein do? Abi Makhnaf in his Maqtal writes that Imam Hussein saw Ali Akbar distraught in pain and suffering. He removed the dagger from the chest of Ali Akbar and looked towards Najaf and said, Oh my father. Today now your son is having his own Khaybar. I have come to my Khaybar. And then Abi Makhnaf narrates that Imam Hussein turned, to, turned towards the camp and he said, Oh young man from my army, I am unable to carry my son. Please help me. I can't carry his dead body. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Let us recite a Surah Fatiha for Marhum, Shakir Karim and the entire Karim family and Kul Marhumin. Rahmallahu man kara al-Fatiha. Ah,